facets of it that we have yet to discover after we've studied it as hard as we can. And Lord, in eternity, you're going to help us to see things we missed and probably things we misunderstood. So we tonight do want and do ask for the presence of the Holy Spirit. He is our teacher. He is the one who instructs us and gives us understanding of the word that he breathed into Solomon's mind and heart to write this book. And so would you come, the very author, Lord, and talk to us about our Savior and talk to us about ourselves that we might see us through your eyes. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, you can have a seat. Well, just to remind you that in the poetry books, in particular uh, the book of the Song of Solomon, um, we are looking at this book from the standpoint of an allegorical interpretation, meaning we aren't just simply looking at this as Solomon describing his bride. Uh, Certainly that is true in the book, but we believe there's another level, another layer. And when it comes to allegorical interpretation, let me be the first to say that there are different opinions, and some of it is speculative. We're not going to say any particular interpretation is absolute. However, we would say this, that when I interpret or bring you an interpretation, while there may be another interpretation of the passage, I'm the first to admit that because I've read several on the text we'll be in tonight, um, nonetheless, all allegorical interpretations need to be measured and judged by the rest of what Scripture says. And that is so we're not hard and fast about this is what this means in a poetic book, as much as to say Is this giving light to and is it consistent with other spiritual truth in the Bible? There are many, many allegorical and spiritual interpretations that are legitimate in the Bible, but we don't want to be over dogmatic about ours being the only or the best uh, interpretations. So here we are in another section of the Song of Solomon, actually the third one that is describing the bride. And so we have said from the beginning that as we look through this book, we're looking at it in terms of the way Christ relates to the church. The church is called the bride of Christ. Israel is not called the bride of Jehovah. Israel is called what? The wife of Jehovah. By the way, they got married. Did you know that? Anybody know where Jehovah married Israel? Mount. Starts with an S, ends with an I. On Mount Sinai, the first covenant, God actually considered the giving of the law and they're accepting it as the covenant of marriage between himself and his people. Did you know that? He'll later say, I'm writing them a certificate of divorce. Did you know that? No, I'm not kidding. It's very interesting. But the analogy in the Old Testament between God and Israel uh, is that of a, a husband and a wife. That is not the relationship yet of Christ and the church. Christ betrothed or we're betrothed to Christ we're engaged we are all a fiance if you will and we're waiting for our wedding day what's called the marriage supper of the lamb in heaven after the rapture but we are spoken for we are committed and we are to live our lives purely for him so the book describes this relationship of a husband and a wife and we look for ourselves when it's talking then about the Shulamite uh, or the the bride of, um, of Solomon Now, a bride or a woman who's going to be a bride, a wife even, cares about how she looks uh, most of the time, but her utmost interest is to be attractive to her groom. That's obvious. Um, Now, in the scriptures here, we're going to see that the bridegroom is describing the bride, how he sees her. Paul says in the New Testament, 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 5, he says, we have our ambition to be pleasing to the Lord. In 1 Corinthians 7, it says that a wife is concerned about the things that would please her husband. It matters to her to live in a way that pleases her husband. He says their interests are divided. Just as a husband cares about his wife, he says the wife cares about pleasing her husband and the Lord. And he's talking there about singleness and why if you're going to stay single, man, have undistracted devotion to the Lord. You don't have a spouse to divide your interests up. But these same truths of a bride caring about how she looks to her husband is very important. Jot down Isaiah 62 in verse 5. 
Here's what God says in the Old Testament. For as a young man marries his virgin bride, so your builder marries you. God speaking. And as a bridegroom is happy in his bride, so your God is happy with you. So God's already using this analogy. He wants his people, Israel, and really us, to see how he feels about us. Look, we could talk about Jesus all day long because there's nothing but perfection in him. There's no end of the facets of his beauty and his, how amazing he is. We'd all agree with that. And there are passages in the book where the bride is describing the bridegroom. When we get to the bridegroom describing the bride, it's a little less comfortable for us because we have these beautiful perfections in the bride and we say, wow, I only wish I looked like that <laughs> to the Lord. We know that he satisfies us. We have a harder time believing that we could possibly delight and satisfy him. But that is what this is all about. In fact, it's interesting to me, in the book of Ephesians, we won't turn there, but in Ephesians 1.18, Paul is praying for the church at Ephesus and really for the whole church, us as well, that their eyes of their heart might be enlightened, that they could see and understand what is the hope of his calling. And he says, what is God's inheritance in the saints? In other words, not what our inheritance is in God, not what our inheritance is in heaven, but that we could actually see the way he sees us as a treasure and valuable and how precious we are that someday he's going to get to inherit us. You might feel like he got the raw end of that deal. That's not how he feels. He looks at his church and sees it as a pearl of great price. We don't like to be in the limelight. It doesn't make sense to us. But John in heaven has the angel say, come, let me show you the bride. Wouldn't have been a problem at all if he said, come, let me so show you the lamb. But he says, come, let me show you the bride. Yes, Christ is glorious, but we share his glory. And this book, if you don't get anything else, you've got to get a hold of God's trying to open your eyes to see you through his eyes. That is all through this book. So the bride already, as we've studied, if you've been with us, has been assured of her beauty, uh, her physical appearance in chapters 4 and again in chapter 6, and now in chapter 7 we have it once again. Let me ask you a question. Why do you think Jesus taught in parables? Jesus taught sometimes exclusively in stories or parables. Raise your hand if you can tell me, why did Jesus do that, Howie? Okay, to put spiritual concepts into a physical reality. Same thing, yes? Paint pictures? So there was a twofold purpose, and Jesus says as much, both to reveal truth and to conceal truth. Uh, that's true. Somebody else want to add to that? Why Jesus taught? And, yeah. It's easier to understand. It's easier to understand. I think that's kind of what you were saying. So obviously, um, when we were kids, we couldn't read words, but people could tell us stories. And guess what? If you think about it, um, I always tell Bible teachers this, realize the importance of illustrations, that people don't think in terms of concepts or words. They think in terms of pictures. If I say, let's go to Ralph's, you don't go, the, here, watch, you don't see the word Ralph's in your head. You think of the Ralph's that you're familiar with. You, you, your brain works that way. We use words to associate with things, and Jesus knows that. He created us. Never a man taught as he did, but he taught in stories because that's the way we think, and it helps us to understand, as somebody said, spiritual principles, which are kind of ethereal, uh, difficult many times for us to get hold of. So Jesus brought it down to earth literally and used physical uh, illustration. So we understand truth better when we can clearly see it. That's why 13 times, not in the first three verses, we're only going to handle three verses tonight, in the first 10 verses, the word like is used in our text. She is like, this part of her body is like, continuously telling us uh, something about his bride to give us an appreciation, and it's in there that we see so much of this truth. I, it was uh, that famous poem by uh, Elizabeth Barrett Browning, How Do I Love Thee? Let Me Count the Ways. I love thee to the depth and the breadth and the height my soul can reach when feeling out of sight for the ends of being and ideal grace. I love thee to the level of every day's most quiet need by sun and candlelight. I love thee freely as men strive for right. I love thee purely as they turn from praise. I love thee with the passion put to use in my old griefs 
and with my childhood's faith. I love thee with a love I seem to lose, with my lost saints. I love thee with the breath, smiles, tears of all my life, and if God choose, I shall but love thee better after death. Well, the poetry here in Hebrew is very picturesque, and we want to pull some truths out of it. But jot down uh, Psalm 3011. Psalm 3011. It says, you have turned for me my mourning into dancing. You have loosed my sackcloth and girded me with gladness. And then add to that Psalm 149, verse 3. Psalm 149, verse 3 says, let them praise his name with dancing. Let them sing praises to him with timbrel and with lyre. Now, the reason I bring these two verses up is, uh, in addition to them, in Ecclesiastes, Solomon, the author of this book, says, there is a time to dance. Did you know that? There is a time for mourning and there's a time of dancing. Uh, now, I know when it comes to the issue of dancing, sometimes Christians are a little bit like, oh, I don't know about that, you know, because the only kind of dancing some of us know has been very ungodly dancing. But there's a lot of different kinds of dancing. There's dancing in the body, in the, in the Bible. Um, and the reason I mention it here is the chapter division is very unfortunate. Actually, verse 1 of chapter 7 is verse 2 in the Hebrew Bible. Say so. Well, the last verse of the previous chapter has the bride in a place of dancing. So I want you to look at that. Look at the last part of chapter 6. Why should you gaze at the Shulamite as at the dance of the two companies? And then it goes on to talk about the bride's feet. Most commentators believe that the bride is dancing as the bridegroom is looking at her. Now, you might say, can Christians dance, Pastor? The answer to that is very simple. Some can and some can't. <laughs> I know which group I am in, just so you know. Um, by the way, it's interesting. As the bride is described in chapters 4 and 6, it's from the head down. In this chapter, it's from the feet up. Just completely reversed, just interesting. Put this down, let's look at some principles. First of all, we see the bride has pretty feet. The bride has pretty feet. How beautiful are your feet in sandals, O prince's daughter. You know, I remember I, I grew up with three sisters, and um, one of the things that we had in our medicine chest growing up with, was this bottle of white lotion that was, it was called pretty feet. You guys remember that? Some of you? I don't know. Maybe only girls know of it. I don't know. It was for dead skin removal. Uh, frankly, the phrase pretty feet is pretty much an oxymoron anyway. <laughs> if we're honest, it's not the most attractive part of anybody's body. Um, so it's interesting that he describes her feet as beautiful. Um, but let's get to the spiritual principle. We'll put this down. Be one who brings the good news. The good news. And I want you to jot down Romans 10 and verse 15. Romans 10, verse 15. How will they preach? I'm not sure what translation that is, guys. I'm using New American Standard, so if those are in another one, we can, it's going to be confusing if they're all in a different translation. But Romans 10 and verse 13, let me just read it to you. Uh, it says, or verse 15, how will they preach unless they are sent, talking about missionaries, just as it is written, quoting the Old Testament, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news who announce good things and announcing that our God reigns. Um, here, the beautiful feet in Isaiah and then referred to by the Apostle Paul are obviously those who share the gospel, those who tell other people about Jesus. You know, I was, uh, <coughs> excuse me, 13 when two men, twice my age, over twice my age, maybe three times my age, I don't know, they were old men, um, <laughs> strangers to me, uh, on a Friday night when I was up in a mountain cabin at a church camp that was not my church, um, decided to tell me about the gospel. And I had gone to church my whole life. I thought I was a Christian. In fact, I was sure I was a Christian until I found out I wasn't. And uh, they asked me if I had ever received Christ, and I didn't know what that was. And, and uh, their names were Jess uh, Maples and Gene Schaefer. Now, that was the beginning. That was the night I met them, and it was also the net, night I met Jesus. Wouldn't you like it if the first time somebody met you, they also met Jesus? Can I tell you something? Uh, that was in 1971, so however many years ago that was. Hardly a day goes by that I don't thank God 
for Gene Schaefer and Jess Maples. And you know, can I tell you something? Those men had pretty feet, though neither one of them ever took off their shoes. Because God used them to share information that changed my forever. And the Bible says we can, every one of us can have pretty feet as far as being used by God to bring this information. I just find it interesting. The bride has beautiful feet. In Ephesians 6, we're told that our feet should be shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Several of you said, what does it mean to be a Christian? It means we have peace. Well, we stand in peace. We don't just visit it once in a while. That's where our permanent stand is with the Lord. We have peace with God because of the grace of God. Of God, And so now every believer in the body of Christ, if you will, is pictured, is on a mission to tell everyone the good news, to announce peace and also that our God reigns. By the way, it's interesting. When Moses, Exodus 3, meets God, the burning bush, what is he told to do with his sandals? Take them off. And of course, Moses represents the law. The law comes through Moses, not grace, <laughs> On the day when the law came, 3,000 people died, by the way. On the day when the Spirit it descends in Acts chapter 2, 3,000 souls are saved. But Moses represents the law, and when he meets God, he's, his sandals come off because he's standing on holy ground. But think about the prodigal. When he comes home, what happens to him? The father puts sandals on his feet because the prodigal represents the grace of God, you see. And so we're to minister and even as this bride has sandals on her feet, it representing, if you will, the grace, I just love this picture that she is going about telling other people the good news. You know, I, sometimes I think we make a mistake when we try to approach the gospel from the standpoint of worrying about everything somebody doesn't know. And sometimes, you know, somebody might say, hey, what's the good news? Well, the good news is you're going to hell. Well, that's not the good news. It may be true, and it's also true some people need to understand the bad news before they can ever appreciate the good news, I don't doubt that. But by and large, many, many, many people in our lives right now in America have actually never heard the good news. I grew up in America. I grew up in the church. I did not know the gospel. I, don't, I wouldn't suggest you just because somebody attended our church, a kid grew up here, he would know the gospel. I believe it's possible because Satan wants to blind the eyes of the unbelieving that people can grow up in Bible teaching. I didn't grow up in a Bible teaching church. I didn't. But people who grow up in Bible teaching churches and not know the gospel until somebody explains it to them. How will they believe in, unless someone is sent? How will they hear without a preacher? So it's important that we tell people the good news. You know, when I was a cop here in Placentia, there was one particular sergeant who just seemed to hate, I was going to say Christians, but he kind of hated everybody, actually. He was just really hard to work with, um, a big guy with a Foul mouth, foulest mouth. I worked around a lot of people with bad mouths. He was the worst in the 10 years I was a cop. No question about it. Um, and I, I remember um, after I left uh, police work, I went back to visit my friends, went to a briefing. I was sitting in the break room area, and this guy came in, sat down next to me, and I thought, oh, great, here we go again, because he would always belittle me for being a Christian or make fun of whatever, whoever is around it, just the way he was. And he would talk lousy, filthy language. So he sat down next to me. He goes, how's it going, company? And I'm going, great, how are you? He said, well, I just wanted to let you know I became a Christian. I literally almost fell off my chair. I'm thinking, what? Kids, no way, this guy. I go, what do you mean? He said, I became a Christian. He didn't cuss once. He said, you want me to tell you how it happened? I go, yeah, I do. He said, I didn't go to church or anything. He said, some people came to my door. And they talked to me about Jesus. And he said something to me. He said, you know, you know why I never went to church? I said, no, I don't. Before that. He said, because I always knew I was going to hell. So I figured, God bless you. He said, I always knew I was going to hell. So I figured, why would I go someplace to have somebody tell me I was going to hell? That was his perception of what would happen in a church. Now, God forbid, but there are some churches that is exactly what would happen. But there are many that it's not. But you see how Satan can deceive somebody, keep them away from the source of where they might hear the gospel? So praise God the church did. You know, Jesus never told the world to go to church. But he did tell the church, go into all the world, preach the gospel. Praise God, somebody did that in his neighborhood. And he's now a brother in the Lord. Man, that was an awesome day. So the bride has pretty feet. 
put this down, letter B. Uh, it speaks of her hips, which uh, it's, it, he mentions her hips, which speak of her precious strength and purity. In um, verse 1, the curves of your hips are like jewels, the work of the hands of an artist. Put in strength and purity. Now, jewels speak of that which is precious or valuable. An artist's work, that which is attractive. Uh, the King James Version here speaks of it as the joints of her thighs. Now, interesting, because the thighs of the human body are the strongest muscle structure in your body. So put this down. Be one who runs in the right direction. One who runs in the right directions. There are three muscles that make up your hamstring. They run down the back of the thigh. They uh, bend the knee, and they extend the leg at the hip. The reason I say this is this is a strong muscle in a, a woman's body, anybody's body, but the idea here, I think, includes that idea of the capacity to run, and that's partially what makes her beautiful to the Lord. We are told in the Bible that we are to run, pursue holiness, or run toward the Lord. We are also told that we are to run from or flee temptation. So interesting, we have the thighs of the woman which, by the way, speaks of her purity, and the bride is being commended for her strength and her purity. Jot down Proverbs 31, verse 17. Here, the, the Proverbs 31 woman, she girds herself with strength, and she makes her arms strong. And then also Proverbs 31, 25. Strength and dignity are her clothing, and she smiles at the future. Just as a woman, to maintain her purity, has to say no, so we too, um, you might say, we're, we're tempted, we are to be those who maybe just wear that, that old dare bracelet, just say no. As Christians, we're to grow in our capacity to run from evil and run toward the Lord, and our beauty is in our strength and in our purity both. So, put this down, letter C. We uh, have the next is her navel. Uh, she is unbound to her old life given at birth. Put in the word unbound. Look at verse 2. Your navel is like a round goblet which never lacks mixed wine. Well, that's an interesting verse. A goblet of mixed wine is a picture of sweet refreshment to the bridegroom. But I want you to see this interesting reference to her navel and the beauty there. You might say, this is really weird, Bob. Jot down Ephesians 2 and verse 3. Paul says... Uh, to believers among the Gentiles, among the unsaved, we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh. This was our BC days, our before Christ days. We were indulging the desires of the flesh and indulging the desires of the mind. And we were, what, what's the next two words? We were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. And if you think about the navel, you might say it's a reminder of the fact we were once bound naturally, but that cord has been cut and we are now free. Uh, when you're born, you're bound. And in a sense, spiritually, there's no question that's also true. As believers, we are free from bondage to our flesh. We are free from bondage to our own nature. The Bible says, sin shall not be master over you. Uh, uh, jot this down. One of the applications for us then is to live dead live dead. You say, what does that mean? Jot down 1 Peter 4, first two verses. 1 Peter 4, beginning in verse 1. Therefore, since Christ has suffered, and the Greek means suffered death, by the way. Therefore, since Christ has suffered death in the flesh, arm yourselves also with the same purpose, because he who has suffered death in the flesh has ceased from sin. Now listen, this is an important concept in the Bible. The idea that we've died, we're alive physically, but we have died is very prominent, especially in the book of Romans, Romans 6 and 7. For instance, we are told we have died to the law. We're not trying to be perfected by God or earn performance brownie points with God. Well, I went on Wednesday night. What do I get for that? Uh, nothing. God's not rewarding us of giving us eternal life because we do anything for him. We do for him because we love him. But the law condemns us, but we don't stand condemned anymore. Why? Because we're dead to the law. Now, here's the imagery. 
I like to use. If I were to go out tomorrow because I didn't have enough money for lunch and I decided to rob a bank and I went down to Wells Fargo where I bank and I go, hey, Bob, and I said, hey, and I pull out a gun. Give me all your money. I'm hungry. And they push the button underneath the counter and Placentia PD shows up with every entrance covered and I come out with my gun a blazing, but maybe I get one of them and, and I hit one or two of them, but they shoot me and they kill me. See, this is a great illustration, Bob. This is wonderful. And there I am, I'm dead. They drag me off to the mortuary. They embalm me. Let me just tell you, there's no way in the world the DA wants nor is ever going to make me dragged before a court to be charged with 211 of the penal code. Not going to happen. The laws are there. I did commit the crime. I will never be charged with the crime, and I'll never be punished for the crime. Why? Because I'm dead to the law. The law has no power over a dead man. In the same way, the powers of the flesh, temptation, have no power over a dead man. A dead man is not trying to feed his hunger, his thirst, his bodily appetites. Not at all. He's not, wor he's not worried what other people think. The guy in the casket does not care what you think about his tie. Doesn't matter to him at all. Why? Because he's dead to the desires of the flesh and the desires of the mind. And this is the idea. As believers, we are to be dead to the law and dead to the desires that once naturally animated our life. Augustine, 4th century, what's known as a church father, after he got saved, had lived a very radical life. I think a lot of times people think when we speak of these church fathers, oh, they must have been these godly saints from the time they got born. Oh no, go read about Augustine. He birthed children out of wedlock, lived with women. He was not in a good place. His mom, Monica, she was an on-fire Christian and a broken-hearted one like some of us are for our kids, right? She prayed her son into the kingdom and God did a work. But anyway, after he got saved, he was worried that one day he might see this woman that he, she just kind of held him in bondage and just, you might say, and he was afraid that if he ever saw her, he didn't know what would happen. He just didn't want to see her again. It's like he's walked away from his old life and he hoped he'd never saw her again. One day he was walking down the street and guess who was walking toward him? It was her. And she looked at him and he walked right by her like he didn't even know her. She turned around and she said, Augustine, Augustine, it is I. And he whipped around and he said, but it is not I. And he turned around and he walked away. Because if any man is in Christ, he's a new creature. And he found the strength to say, I'm done with that old life. I am dead to what naturally held me before. Put this down, letter D. It speaks of her belly. I'm sure this is one of our favorite ones. Your belly is like a heap of wheat. If it said cream of wheat, we might not have had a problem too much with it. But anyway, <laughs> heap of wheat. Fenced about with lilies. Well, there you go. That makes it all better. Um, put this down. She is his crop awaiting a future harvest. Now, obviously, as we read this, if this was a compliment when it was written, something has been seriously lost in the translation <laughs> to most of us. I wouldn't recommend you saying that to anybody and expecting them to say, oh, thank you. Oh, man. <laughs> I'll slap your face, too. Um, but there's some truths in here that we want to catch hold of. First of all, be a taste of the Lord's good work on earth. Be a taste of the Lord's good work on earth. Now, most of you know this. In the Old Testament, earthly Israel is often likened to a tree. Psalm 1 is a good example, but it's not the only place. A fig tree, an olive tree, a cedar tree. This is all through the Old Testament. It's the metaphor for God's people. But a tree is earthbound by nature. Interesting, because in the gospel, believers are not likened to a tree. They're likened sometimes to a vine in John 15, for instance, but believers are likened to wheat. Remember that? Jot down Matthew 13 and verse 30. There, Jesus told the parable of the man who had planted wheat, but then the tares were sown by the enemy. And the servant said, you know, what are we going to do? An enemy has sown these poisonous 
weeds, and he tells them, allow both to grow until the what? The harvest. And in the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, first gather up the tares, bind them in bundles to burn them up, but gather the wheat into my barn. Now, the parable, of course, is talking about the fact that when wheat and tares, tares are not wheat, they're what's called the darnel, it's a poisonous plant, um, when they grow up, uh, they look very similar. You can't distinguish between the two when they're young. When they come into full maturity, you can tell the difference, and you could distinguish between them. And, of course, the idea is there will be unbelievers among us. In this room, there are a bunch of believers. Are we all believers? Lord knows. There might be somebody here who says, well, I'm not a believer, and okay, we'll take your word for it. But if we say, we're all Christians, well, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, on that day, so we don't want to deceive ourselves. But the fact is there could be people who think they are like I used to, or people who want to pretend they are, but they're not. There are tares, not true believers, among the true believers. The true believers are likened unto wheat, that good crop. And then at the harvest, only when it's time to take the harvest, when the Lord returns at judgment, will it be discernible, because the Lord will divide us. The Lord will separate the sheep from the goats. He's not asking us to, you're kind of a goat-looking goat person, you got a goat tea, and no, no, we're not supposed to do that. We're not supposed to, you sound like a goat, you know, we're not supposed to be judging one another, but that's what that parable is about. But it's interesting, believers are likened unto wheat. Now, what about wheat? By the way, this was something that was written by a man who pastored a church in the 17th century. He actually uh, was, uh, he pastored a church that would later be pastored by Spurgeon, but he wrote a whole thing about wheat and how wheat are like believers. I'll just summarize because it was a lot longer than this. Um, first of all, he said wheat is a choice grain, and it is among the various grains of the earth. Um, it required a lot of work to produce uh, a wheat crop. It is uniquely hardy. It endures, unlike other crops. For instance, uh, you know it's been really cold lately. Well, barley doesn't do well at all in cold weather. Wheat, it does. In fact, it, does, it gets better. Uh, through cold weather. And it's fascinating how other crops will completely fail, but wheat will actually improve through afflictions. Uh, and in all of these things, it resembles who Christians are. A wheat, when it is mature, the wheat stalk, actually it, the head is heavy, and so it hangs low. And it's a tremendous picture, really, of humility. A mature believer is one who will be like that, will be lowly. Um, Wheat has to be ultimately separated uh, from the straw and from what we know of as the chaff. And also, wheat was the food of kings. It was a choice grain that was used to feed the kings. So it's interesting. It, to, we know in the New Testament, Jesus calls us wheat. The bride here says her stomach is like wheat. Uh, don't focus so much on the stomach. That's not the point of it. John the Baptist said before Jesus showed up on the scene, he said, he who is coming after me is mightier than I. His sandal I'm not worthy to untie. And he said, his winnowing fork is in his hand. What's a winnowing fork? Anybody know? Did you bring your winnowing fork tonight? Nobody? Exactly. Once the grain has been threshed, it's been beaten down so that it's separated, you, they would use air, wind, to go to a high place. That's why... Gideon threshing in a wine vat is a joke. But anyway, they would take the wheat to a high place where the wind would pass by. they throw it in the air, and the breeze would take the lighter chaff away, separating the chaff from the wheat. And John the Baptist said his, Jesus' winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will, uh, he will uh, garner, he'll bring the, the wheat into his garner, into his barns, but the chaff he'll burn with unquenchable fire, referring to to the judgment that's coming. Once again, a reference to believers being wheat. And by the way, it's interesting also, remember when Jesus said, Simon, Satan has desired to sift you like wheat. But don't sweat it, Peter, because I've prayed for you. So there is chaff in the life of a believer that the Lord wants to remove and allows even Satan at times to bring out of our lives or to, to move out of our lives. Um, by the way, normally... The mounds of wheat, because the wheat would be put into mounds, and this is the picture of the belly. Don't say he's not calling her fat. There's no fat check here at all. Uh, 
Um, but <laughs> normally they would fence the wheat mounds with thorns, a fence of thorns to keep wild animals out. This one is fenced around not because it's uh, uh, but with lilies, not for pro being protected, but it's really referring to how attractive it is. The reason I say all that is the bride is connected with this wheat. Obviously, we're wheat. And I like that verse in the scriptures and the Psalms that says, taste and see that the Lord is good. But the Lord is invisible. So how do people taste and see the Lord is good? It's me and you. It's the fruit of the Holy Spirit. It's the life of Christ coming out of us that people can partake of, you see. The very truth. Okay, put this down. E, we come now to her breasts, and it says, uh, I want you to put this down in the word young. Uh, she nourishes the young. In verse 3, he says, Your two breasts are like two fawns, twins of a gazelle. Uh, a couple of verses uh, to jot down. First of all, the Song of Solomon itself, chapter 4 and verse 11. Here he talks about what's in her mouth. Your lips, my bride, drip honey. Honey and milk are under your tongue, and the fragrance of your garments is like the fragrance of Lebanon. We've already studied this, and we mention now honey and milk. Of course, we think of the Holy Land, land flowing with milk and honey. But honey and milk are two metaphors in the Bible for what? Raise your hand if you can help us. Honey and milk both used to describe the Word of God. Psalm 19, sweeter than the drippings of the honeycomb. Psalm 119 saying that God's word is like honey. It never goes bad. Remember, we've often, it's sweet. When Jonathan took of the honey, his eyes were enlightened. The word of God is like honey, but it's also like milk in the Bible. And here we have uh, the reference to her breast. This isn't a sexual reference. It's talking about uh, a mother's nourishment. I want you to jot down 1 Peter 2 and verse 2. Like newborn babies... Peter says to the church, long for the pure milk of the word so that by it you may grow with respect to salvation. A lot of people become Christians, and let me just put it this way. If you became a Christian, you did so as a result of the word of God. Now, now why do I say that? You became a Christian as a result of the word of God. Tell me, can someone tell me what I mean? I know that's kind of weird. Why don't I just do that? Does anybody know what I mean when I said, if you became a Christian, it was a result of the word of God? Yes. The gospel, okay? Yes. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. Anybody else want to add that? Yes. Jesus is the word. The Bible says that the word and faith have to come together. Faith is a response to the word of God. You can't just have faith in whatever and it's valuable. It has to be, faith is only a response to the revealed will and word of God, by the way. That's important to remember because some people think you can just believe something. I don't believe God to do this. Did he ever say that? No, but I'm just going to believe it hard. The Bible doesn't give you any assurance of that. Faith is a response to the Word of God, the promise of God, the will of God. But faith and the Word of God come together and regenerate us according to the New Testament. They have to come together. It's always a response to the Word of God. So you can't come, you can't be saved without the Word of God. There has to be a promise. There's a truth. You believed on the Lord Jesus Christ and you were saved, you see. So there is power in the Word of God. But here's what I want to say. Many people get saved and then wonder why they don't grow. You know, um, not everybody becomes a mature Christian. And it doesn't have to do with how long they've been a Christian. It always cracks me up when somebody says, I've been a Christian for 60 years or 50 years. Well, first of all, if you're telling me that, that's probably not a good sign of your maturity, that you're impressed with how many years you've been a Christian. Because just because you've been a Christian for 50 years doesn't mean you're 50 years mature. There are young Christians who are a year or two in the Lord who are very mature. And there are Christians who have been Christians for years and years and years and years who've never grown up. Remember what the writer of the Hebrews says, by this time you ought to be teachers. But you've come to need milk and not solid food. But solid food is for the mature who, because of practice, have their senses trained to discern good and evil. It's not automatic that you grow to maturity because you're born again. You need to grow up. But how do I grow up? One, one of the very important, there aren't 12, but one of the very most important things is your relationship to this book. Long for the pure milk of the word 
that you may grow with respect to salvation. So if you're struggling, if you're like, I'm not growing, then I guarantee you there's a work that God wants, a new work, a fresh work, a deeper work that God wants to do. You say, well, I'm here in church. Praise God. I'm thrilled that you're here. You say, you're preaching to the choir. What about all those people that come on Sunday that don't come here? I got that. Go tell them. But the fact is, think about this. How many of you have children? I don't mean they're still children, but they were at one time, right? Probably. Can you imagine uh, if you nurse them, if you, you know, you gave them the bottle and they went from milk and then they went to whatever, Pablum or Gerber's or whatever's next, you know, one, two, three, the jars, you got through them all and, and then they finally got to solid food and, and then you, what if, what if a, a baby liked you feeding them so much that they refused to ever learn how to use the fork or the spoon? You say, yeah. Can you just picture, uh, would that be a failure to launch? You've got a 17-year-old. Yeah. Mom, <laughs> starving. Well, I already made the food for you. It's in front of you. I, it's too hot. I need you to blow on it. I don't know how to use that fork. It's like, are you kidding me? How crazy is that? You say, Bob, what's your point? Every Christian needs to learn to be a self-feeder. Every Christian. That doesn't mean we don't need teachers. Oh, no, we still need teachers. Ephesians 4, if we're going to mature to maturity, we need teachers the rest of our life. But every Christian needs to be able to feed themselves. Otherwise, we get stuck, we get stagnated, we get stunted at a level of growth where we're just, we're not moving on. So, but it's not maturity to be able to feed yourself. (laughs) Put this down. Be mature enough to feed others. You see, if we think about her breasts... Those are a perfect demonstration of milk not coming to her, but coming through her. The mature Christian says, I don't want to just be a container to receive God's nourishment. I want to be a conduit. I I need God's word myself to grow, but I want God's word to come out of me that I might help somebody else to minister. When Jesus restored Peter... Remember after he had denied him three times and said, do you love me more than these? And Peter said, you know I love you. What did Jesus say each time? What was it? Feed my sheep. But actually in the Greek, I know the English says that, but it's slightly different. And I'm not talking about the word love in phileo. That's a different study. Actually, the first word that Jesus uses for sheep is not sheep. Anybody know what it is? Lambkins. Literally, feed my baby lambs. Then he says, feed my sheep. But at first he says, just start out feeling, feeling little baby lambs, Peter. That's where I want you to start. You know, when people would go to Chuck Smith, can you imagine a church of 30,000 at its height? Costa Mesa was that big. That's a, that's a city. But anyway, people would come to Chuck all the time, maybe every week, and a lot of times guys, but I'm sure gals too. I feel called to teach the word of God. Praise the Lord. And of course, they were hoping he would let them up into the pulpit the next Sunday, you know but he was wise enough to not offer that, he would always say the same thing. I want you to go down, and he would tell them the person's name that runs our Sunday school. Sunday school, yep, you want to teach, praise the Lord. I want you to go in and offer to teach our third graders. Third graders? Yep. Why? Because if you can teach third graders, you can teach anybody. That's what he would say. A lot of them go, wow, I feel called to preach to the masses. Well, go right ahead then. But where, this is the way you start. Feed my little lambs. Feed my little ones. Who are you feeding? By this time, you ought to be teachers, you see. Feed my lambs. Feed someone else. Minister the word of God that you've already received. Yes, we need to start taking the word of God in more and more. But boy, I'll tell you what. If you take food in and you don't get food out, that's never a good thing. Right? It's not how much food you can take in. You've got to digest it. It's got to work its way into your life. And it's got to come through you to someone else, otherwise bad things happen. Jot down Isaiah 28, 9. To whom would he teach knowledge and to whom would he interpret the message? Those just weaned from milk, those just taken from their breath, this association with milk and the word of God. 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 2. Paul says, I gave you milk to drink, not solid food or meat, for you were not yet able to receive it. Indeed, even now you're not able. Here are Christians. They've been believers, like in Hebrews, long enough that they should be going on, but they haven't gotten past milk. There is a milk stage, and, and there's always milk in every passage. There's milk and there's meat 
in, in, in all through the Bible. So it's not that milk becomes bad, but you shouldn't be just taking milk alone. And Hebrews 5.13 is the one I made reference to before. Everyone who partakes only of milk is not accustomed to the word of righteousness, for he is an infant. So this principle, she has this capacity to feed or nourish the young. And then finally put this down, we see a beautiful balance is seen in what the bride provides. Um, again, it mentions your two breasts are like two fawns, twins of a gazelle, which I know sounds very uh, provocative. Now, a couple of ideas of what people have said. I can't be dogmatic on any of this, but uh, this idea of the, of the breast being twins and the idea of nourishment. Some feel that faith and love are the twin virtues through which she feeds others. Works for me. Um, we don't know. Someone else, this is an interesting idea. Someone said this is a reference or that represents the Old Testament and the New Testament. So it's like, okay, um, I could, I could, that works too. But that is a truth in the New Testament. By the way, an interesting verse on that, Matthew 13 and verse 52. Jesus said to them, therefore, every scribe, now a scribe is somebody who knows the Bible, okay, an expert in the Bible. Therefore, every scribe who has become a disciple of the kingdom of heaven is like the head of a household who brings out of his treasure things new, and things old. Uh, may I just say that um, if you're a person who loves the New Testament and reads the New Testament and studies the New Testament and you think, I don't really need this other part of my Bible, it, I mean, it's, it makes it a nice big book and I like having it in case we have to study the Song of Solomon on Wednesdays, but I don't read it, I don't understand it, and I don't need it, you're wrong. A scribe who's going to be able to minister effectively brings out of the treasure things old and things new. The old covenant is got to be understood. If you want to know who Jesus is, you will not ever know him if you only study the New Testament. He said, I came to fulfill the law. <laughs> What's the law? You don't know? You can't appreciate who Jesus is and what he's done for you. You do not know what he saved you from. You need your whole Bible. Let me put it this way. Nothing but a whole Bible will ever do to make a whole Christian. That is why we study on Wednesday night Old Testament books. We're on this wonderful adventure to find Jesus in the Scriptures, in the Old Testament. And can I just remind you? He's everywhere in here. He opened the scriptures, which the scriptures did not mean the New Testament when he did it in Luke 24, because they weren't written yet. The New Testament was not written. He opened the scriptures, our Old Testament, that was their whole Bible, to the two men on the road to Emmaus, showing them everything concerning himself. What a Bible study that was. Wouldn't you like to have been there and had Jesus go, well, I'm right here, did you see me? It's kind of like, where's Wallo? There I am, there I am, he's there, he's in that passage. It's all about him. He is the author, he is the theme he, he is the beginning and the end. It's all about him. Amen? So we come to remind ourselves who our bridegroom is and in this particular text to try to start seeing ourselves because ultimately as you'll go through to verse 10, you'll see that the bride, he is amazed at us. And I know that sounds weird, but he is amazingly, intoxicatingly in love with us. And... Uh, pretty neat to have someone like Jesus be in love with you. Pretty hard to imagine that being true. I think some of us feel like we're going to get to heaven and he's going to go, who are you? How? Uh, I'm your servant. Uh, Peter, look him up. I don't know who he is. I don't recognize him. <laughs> Lord, you know me. I, I'm not one of those Matthew 7 that you never knew me. I prayed, received Christ, I'm born again. Check the books. <laughs> he's there. Well, all right, I'll let you in. Don't expect anything. We kind of think we're barely going to get into heaven by the skin of our teeth, and he's going to say, just sit over there for like a zillion years, and you're in trouble or something. You know, like, can I tell you something? You don't get to just go to heaven. You are the bride. That means you're the queen. You're going to rule and reign with Christ. He gives you the same keys, the same authority, the same glory. It, it is going to blow your mind. It'll blow my mind, and I know what it says, but don't see yourself the way the enemy wants you to see yourself, the way your flesh wants you to see yourself, the way your friends maybe, maybe your own family goes, who do you think you are? I'm not talking about being prideful of yourself. Let him who boasts, boast in this. You boast in who your God is that would see someone like you. Last thing I'll tell you, this Indian, he was an alcoholic. 
for years in this town. Everybody knew he was the town drunk. Suddenly stopped drinking completely. And his friend said, hey, what's with that? He goes, what do you mean? He said, I don't drink anymore. He said, why wouldn't you drink? You drink all the time. You drink more than any of us. He said, why would you stop drinking? And he walked them out to this tree outside. He said, come with me. He dug, he's a big guy. He dug his hand down into the ground to explain to them why he didn't drink anymore. And he grabbed hold, he went through the dirt and he found a worm. He took that worm and with his other hand, he took some dry weeds that were there, put the worm down for a minute, lit a match, lit the grass in his hand on fire, put the worm on the top of the heap of the grass and let them watch as that fire started to quickly head toward the worm. And then right before it burned the worm, he grabbed it out and he said, me, that worm. Because he had met Jesus Christ. And he realized, and for the rest of his life, it didn't just change the way he lived, it changed the way he saw himself. He knew what he used to be, but he was saved now. He was precious to God, and he would never be what he used to be again. Let's pray. Lord, tonight, when I read Psalm 22, you call yourself, Jesus, a worm and not a man. Lord, you took our place it was us who should be saying that, but instead you've called us your bride, your beautiful one, the one that you want to give all of heaven for all eternity, that you want to spend every moment of every day of the rest of days with. Lord, sometimes we don't like ourselves. We don't even like spending time with us. To think that you never stop thinking of us and they're only good thoughts. It blows our minds. But thank you that you see us as beautiful. Thank you it's not just wishful thinking. It's really true because we are the body of Christ. So fill us with joy. Fill us with a sense of, of grace, an amazing grace. And then, Lord, I pray that we'd go out with pretty feet tonight and tell people that need to know you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand. And